because about organization. <laughs> uh, I am Alexander from Tallinn University of Technology, Estonia. And uh, 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 I, sh I should be to, uh, the chair of this session. And uh, let's uh, do it in such a way that, no, it means that my work to follow my time, the time of presentation. For every presentation, there is 15 minutes, including questions. It means that this depends on you. Would you like that somebody ask you or not? Because we have to, let you to leave some time for questions. Okay, and uh, let's do in such a way that uh, when uh, it's left, well, let's say three minutes to end presentation, then I will be in stand position I, as now. When you have time, I am seated. Okay. Yeah, and now uh, we have the first presentation. Yeah, I ask all of you to present to your co-authors and so on, to make some introduction uh, about your book, because I, I have no any information, only this uh, booklet, that's <laughs> all. So, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, let's okay. begin. Uh, sorry for interrupting yeah. you at the beginning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my name is Kazimierz Bogdanas, I come from Tunis University of Technology, and I'm here to present you a paper on a conversion distributed positioning algorithm for Internet of Things. It was co-written on me, Ugnery Susas, and Alkima de Svenskaustas from Computer Department. This is basically a, a project uh, aimed to uh, develop uh, an, an authentic authentication uh, method, multimodal method for Internet of Things. So the outline of the presentation, I will describe you the motivation for this research. Um, short briefly describe the current use techniques for uh, positioning in Internet of Things or in general indoor positioning. Uh, I will describe the algorithm. Uh, I'll show you our simulation and its results. Uh, this is fairly simple uh, idea so I don't think it will take much time. Uh, we can skip over um, simple ideas. So. The general motivation is to create a multimodal um, of the identification authentication method for objects in the Internet of Things. Um, reasons for that is basically, uh, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, you want to know the sensors you're getting data from are true. So for example, no one has swapped uh, the sensors, no one is uh, fudging the data, so in Internet of Things you want to have some verification. And location can be one of the, of the uh, variables you can use to establish the validity of your data. Uh, additionally, you might be interested in the data from only certain region, or let's say you are in, in underground sewers and you are interested in collecting toxic gas, for example, amount of toxic gas you are interested in certain areas, and you want to make sure that your sensors are in that area. So, localization is actual for, for these uh, problems. And, of course, there are huge problems with uh, radio frequency-based uh, positioning if we don't have access to GPS or Galileo or not, uh, GLONASS, uh, satellite-based navigation systems. So, whenever we have a roof over our head uh, or attenuated signals, and especially with Internet of Things, very cheap sensors, we basically have no access to this information from big satellite based air positioning information. So that's why a lot of uh, uh, research has been uh, involved into in indoor positioning or positioning for Internet of Things. Uh, the main uh, approaches to solve this problem first is the received signal strength and but up to right now, the conclusion is, is, is if anyone advises you to do something with received signal strength, you should smile and back away from that person. Because it's not really useful uh, un unless it's kind of proximity uh, indication. Then we have angle of arrival, but for angle of arrival, we need a more sophisticated antennas and signal processing. So for Internet of Things, this one also kind of uh, not really apl applicable right now. Then we have time of arrival based uh, estimation and measurements. 
and these can be differentiated into basically time of arrival when you just measure and have synchronized time around or throughout your whole network. But for that you need really good clocks, so basically atomic level MEMS uh, clocks, which cost in order of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, so not applicable again. Time differential of arrival also requires clock synchronization, even though locally, but still uh, is a problem. And one of the approaches which is feasible, it still has its own problems, is round time. It basically, when you send a packet to, uh, between two network nodes, it is being returned and then you divide the time which the packet traveled minus the time while, when it was being processed. So this, might, this can produce a sufficiently acceptable results. Uh, of course, we need a better hardware for that still, uh, better clocks, but this might be feasible in the future. And positioning can be done uh, for in the network in several fashions and combination of those. First is centralized, decentralized and ad hoc. The centralized has issues because you need to, uh, when the solution is being computed for every user as a centralized uh, location, you basically need to transfer all the data to that center. It has to be processed and sent back, so you have network overhead, uh, energy, more energy uh, requirements for these. However, the nodes it themselves can be much simpler. The decentralized uh, and combination of centralized is probably the, the most promising approach, also with uh, increasing computational capacities of nodes. So, and it allows us to create this ad hoc network by adding additional nodes to it and having it expand in a natural fashion. So we are basically aiming for round trip time, ad hoc, decentralized uh, solution. Uh, for our algorithm, I would like to define several ideas and, and define different um, network nodes. So the first one network node, which we are talking about, are the stationary network nodes. So the ones which are fixed in location. Then the user nodes are the ones which can move through the network and communicate with the network nodes. Network nodes between themselves also create an ad hoc network, so they, they are able to communicate. If they are able to communicate, they are able to make, uh, perform range measurements. So that's good for us. Local reference frame is, is a term basically for us uh, to, to use to create uh, to, to compute position in very small local area between four uh, net uh, network nodes. Absolute positioning solution is a solution which incorporates global navigation satellite system but, uh, coordinates, so basically the GS84 or any other kind of uh, global coordinate system. Uh, virtual network node, I'll elaborate on this one a bit further. Uh, oh, out of time. So, and network convergence is an event when the network uh, accepts uh, uh, absolute positioning systems. So the first thing what we, what we uh, su suggest in doing is basically try to f form the pr most primitive um, geometrical structures in the network. If we have 2D network, that would be triangles. In 3D case, we are for looking for uh, tetrahedrons. So, well, basically what we do is for every node we create a local reference uh, frame uh, with coordinate systems at the beginning of the node 1, then we choose second node, there's primitive ideas, but we choose second node on the x-axis, it's a third node which is uh, lying on the, uh, on the plane between x and y-axis, and that forms a triangle for us. So the last rule which we need is basically that our fourth uh, node should not be on that plane where triangle lies. If, uh, and all these uh, uh, vertices represent communication. So if we, all these four nodes can communicate in between them, we can form a tetrahedron and then we can uh, compute a, a relative positioning uh, between them. So just using s simple uh, trilateration. Uh, when we do that, we do it not for only one of these, but for every, uh, every point we search for as many tetrahedrons as we can form. When we do that, we can accumulate them, aggregate in one local reference frame. Uh, 
there is no point in expanding it by trying to combine between two different uh, uh, different nodes because if you do that you need to perform rotations so because uh, the directions of uh, local reference frame axis are accidental the f basically the it depends on what what is the second node <coughs> which you choose that will be the direction of x axis so they are uh, accidental and if uh, according to distance how far these nodes are the farther the way they are the bigger error is introduced when you apply rotations so that's why we skip the rotation altogether and we just stay with the local reference frames and we form a network of these local reference frames now because these local reference reference frames are overlapping we can basically um, map from one coordinates to another uh, uh, seamlessly uh, during this uh, performance of our uh, simulation. So uh, the next step is basically tr uh, trying to obtain absolute positioning system solution and integrating it into our network. It is done uh, by having uh, user uh, nodes which are uh, global positioning uh, which have global positioning uh, solution some kind of, through let's say GPS unit and we try to integrate them through virtual network nodes so whenever we perform a measurement of um, user node and it is being localized in uh, let's say uh, 1352 uh, local reference frame and local reference frame 13421 we can basically uh, use the same solution to tie together these two local reference frames. When we have more than uh, several um, measurements, we can basically uh, extrapolate the uh, coordinates of our network nodes to the, uh, to the absolute positioning system solution. Uh, we perform s some sim simulations basically uh, with 100 uh, uh, network nodes uh, with reduced communication range and error of 2%, which basically corresponds to, uh, if, if we do Wi-Fi, that would be a, a, an error of uh, 2 3 meters. And uh, we have some, uh, we had some user nodes going through that network, which uh, allowed us to incorporate abs absolute positioning uh, solution into our network. So uh, basically that's how simulation looks and we just launched uh, through them some in linear trajectories, uh, several uh, user, network, user nodes. So uh, through iterations we can see that network converges. It doesn't uh, reach the full convergence of a network because uh, some nodes cannot form uh, tetrahedrons and cannot form uh, local reference frames. Uh, this can be helped with these virtual nodes. Uh, but in general, we achieve pretty good result in, in the um, propagation of our absolute positioning system solution. Um, yes, so the next step for us is we, are, we will try to, we develop trying to publish now um, a new approach how to use dynamic parameters of uh, user, uh, network, user nodes and how to incorporate them to use the movement information on the movement. And basically, uh, uh, afterwards, we'll try to create a full identification uh, solution for Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. It's quite interesting. <laughs> and uh, now we have time only for such short questions. Not for discussion. <laughs> Just a note. Uh, do not discard time of arrival because no, if no. you are using time sum of arrival and it is the same node, actually ellipsoids uh, turns into the sphere. No, I, I'm not discarding uh, so it. Just think microelectromechanical uh, oscillators now they are gaining in uh, price and actually it is cheaper to buy a MEMS oscillator than it, it, it is How much cheaper the, the, for the crystal. Unless you are talking about chip scale atomic clocks. Yeah, I was talking about chip scale atomic clocks. But those are not MEMS. Ah. Well, yeah, technically not. Just, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody else. No, okay. It's good that we can go to the next. Thank you again.
Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's work from Latvia. Yes. Mm. Yeah, it's been presented, has it? Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Janek Pachen from Riga, Riga Technical University. So it's best. No. In my paper, which named Development of V2V and GPS Based Collision Warning Algorithm for Uncontrolled Intersection, I tried to connect together two systems. One of these is GPS, Global Positioning System, and second system is V2V, Vehicle to Vehicle. This is information exchange between uh, cars. Uh, the main aim was to create a warning algorithm to improve road safety, road traffic safety. As you know, now it's high development uh, in the intelligent traffic system is uh, always, anywhere. But uh, road, tra uh, road traffic safety is a very serious problem. To improve it, I propose the collision warning algorithm. One more. Exchange of information required for algorithm is achieved by means of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication system. Vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle is from United States, uh, abbreviation, but uh, in Europe is car-to-car, uh, -car, C2C. It's better for Europe and country. Physical and data link layer are regulated by standard. This helps. And message contents intervals and priority as defined by standard this. I use here in my algorithm so call it uh, BSM uh, or basic safety message message which is from this standard to establish or determine the safety criterion it's worthwhile to present a car not as a single point, a point with, uh, which is consigned with a GPS antenna, but a certain rectangle that will display not just the external dimensions of the car, but also the uh, preset or determined safety zone. <coughs> there are two reasons why we use this uh, model. The first reason is that uh, placement of GPS uh, antenna and overall size of uh, the car is known. And it's very easy to share this information between all participants of road traffic using V2V. Then we have to uh, use the possibility to establish safety criteria. Uh, the main prerequisite for prevention of motor vehicle collision is that there must be no, must be no simultaneous overlapping of the projection of two vehicles along the coordinate axis. Oh, it's possible to establish it mathematically. Uh, the first step, we create function S and x and s, y, uh, y, s. That's a letter s from safety, s. We create these functions and use these mathematical expressions. And it's safety criteria is this mathematical expression <coughs> uh, have be everywhere in always. So there are a lot of scenarios uh, on the road. One of these is very known and very often. This is uh, forwarding from through intersection, through unregulated intersection in straight, the first, uh, and 
to the le uh, writing to the left, this will be the second, uh, from stop position, like here. And now, very simply, we create motion equitation for uh, first car, then more uh, equitation from second car, and create these functions, this will be uh, with, uh, which were before, and simulating this process, analyzing during the time. This is result. If here is the vehicle pa car or vehicle vehicle parameters with uh, speed acceleration, uh, some words about acceleration. Uh, uh, cars acceleration is from uh, from start uh, stop position. Uh, this acceleration depends on not only cars parameters, uh, but uh, depend on uh, weather conditions. Uh, and uh, depend on uh, drivers' uh, psychophysical conditions. Oh, here is uh, acceleration, 1.9 meters second. This is not very quickly, but average. If you, you can see here that dependence of these functions on graphs. Here is all everywhere and every time moment is this uh, uh, our expression is true. And result is that we have um, proposed that um, intersection passage will be safe. So if we reduce starting acceleration twice, This is possible collision zone. And uh, probably, probably will be collision. The second, turning left. So, and in my, in my simulation is only one car. Uh, sometimes it's car this, but here is only one car. Here, the trajectory of movement of the car through the intersection is turning left. Change the curve angle and linearity speed of, of, of the car. Now the simulations result, results. This with acceleration 1.9 uh, very safety, safely, and uh, second, when we reduce uh, starting uh, acceleration, uh, there is possible collision zone. So it's possible to uh, analyze uh, this uh, equation, not equation, this mathematical expression uh, for all pairs of uh, use of car, which is on this square. And conclusion. So, here was in this paper proposed a safety criteria. Uh, uh, I want to tell you that um, this is only warning message. The final decision or final solution to do anything uh, is the driver's solution. And the future work, I think that it's necessary to check it uh, on the te test, field test, on real conditions. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so the question, please. Yeah. We have enough time to discuss. Yes. Yeah, did you take into account the accuracy of GPS? Uh, because it is, uh, the GPS can make errors of 2 meters, 3 meters. Yes. And for how yes, sir. Oh, this is your problem. Okay. Uh, this is a question about accuracy. Yes. yes? GPS. Uh, really, uh, local GPS 
give the accuracy about 5, 10, or sometimes 15 meters. It's very bad result. Uh, the, we, need, uh, we need to use GPS accuracy less than um, minimal distance between vehicles. So it's possible to use uh, GPS with uh, differential correction, with real-time differential correction. Yes, it's enough. Uh, color meter, it is good for accuracy. Local is not very good, but uh, with differential correction, uh, we don't need using phase correction. It's enough. Simple difference correction. Okay. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, have you considered expanding your security zone dependent on the uh, velocity or acceleration? For example, if a car is accelerating, you basically expand the safe zone because it's uncertain to rise. Yes, we, uh, from the first Where is gentle. We, it's possible to use adaptive uh, geometrical model. Yes, sure, this is not a problem. Okay. If the velocity or speed is uh, higher, we have to... Uh, no, but maybe there is no reason for that. Maybe it's good enough, that's why you didn't use it. Difficult to say right now. I don't see about it, but this is a good idea. To less, uh, to do less, sometimes more to do this zone, this uh, safety zone. Yes. Where is the? I, I do. I don't see. It. Uh, maybe I'll answer such quite simple question. Is uh, there somebody in car industry who knows about your work? Have you any project? No, I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very difficult to it's a, it's uh, a <laughs> to find you. Uh, all these works uh, in uh, car industry is uh, private yeah, yeah, yeah. property of uh, this uh, industry. Yes, yeah. yeah. from the for the years it's free. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Next is me. Sorry. Oh, yes. my turn. Uh, this work is done in collaboration uh, uh, between Tallinn University of Technology and Averia University. And um, uh, mainly all what I'd like to say <coughs> is written on my slides. <laughs> and uh, 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 no, in the introduction, uh, the, that we know that data processing <coughs> is one of the most common procedures in systems and mainly uh, mainly all of it uh, is going to that we are with like extracting items with the desired characteristics no it's uh, it, uh, this is work pr is proposed for real time systems it means that uh, it means that uh, all uh, 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 processing ha has to be done as fast as possible and to, uh, to reach this high performance we use FP FPGA based systems no, I, I think that's quite good uh, solution for us uh, and uh, then what we are doing now uh, the, uh, first of all we, we would like no th there is such sequential channel uh, inputs are going one after another and then uh, we suppose that this data that are arrived from outside world uh, they are uh, filtered 
and uh, only uh, 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 some of them are going to processing and what is important that processing is done in com communication uh, uh, time. You see, it means that uh, as uh, the last data is arrived, uh, last data is arrived, then all uh, processing is done and uh, 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 the result is going to the output. Okay? Uh, and uh, what are distinctive features of this work? No, first of all, uh, first, uh, as I, uh, you see, uh, you saw on previous slide, we, we are trying to detect or filter uh, this data, I, I, uh, and we use uh, one approach that was uh, presented six years ago on FPL conference, but we adjusted for filtering. And uh, then the, uh, the second is the fast, uh, fast data processing based communication time network that allow both sequential data acquisition and processing to be done in parallel. No, it's such very simple examples. Maybe it's not so correct written, but uh, it's not classical set, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, but uh, let's suppose that uh, we have uh, a, a such input, uh, one after another is going, and uh, here we can see uh, some uh, values that are repeated, no? for example, three and four. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, we uh, filter them, uh, and the uh, result is here. Yes? Um, uh, th this filtering could be uh, more complex. For example, we, uh, we can uh, uh, take only uh, some values from this. In this example, uh, uh, we, we <coughs> this uh, values th that greater or equal to five and less than or, th uh, than or equal to six are discarded or blocked. In, in this case, the, uh, after filtering, we, we have this sequence. Okay. And, and uh, there are two points in filtering. Uh, it's presented here. All the uh, source items are included in the output sequence just once. Yes. Non-repeat. If there are several items with, with the same value, then just one of them is included. Th then, uh, additionally, all pre uh, predefined and explicitly, uh, uh, explicitly indicated values are removed from the output sequence. It's data filtering, uh, and this uh, implementation of data filtering as I told, it's done from, uh, from our previous work. It was, uh, this work was f uh, done for sorting, but we adjust <coughs> uh, uh, it for filtering. The idea is very simple. We have memory. Words are of uh, uh, size of one bit. Then uh, every input data we consider as address in this memory. And you see, if, if uh, some data is arrived, then one is written in corresponding address. If the next one is going, and uh, is, uh, if it's repeated data, then uh, one is written already uh, here. It means that uh, this input data should be blocked or Here is a simple Cantrell circuit that because we, can, uh, we have to make preloading to avoid un, uh, undesirable, undesirable values. But it's done only one time in, this, uh, in the beginning of the process. You see. And it may, uh, look, if, uh, if it should be blocked, it's blocked. If it shouldn't be blocked, then it's going to the out. 
it's no, we call it, uh, uh, it is filtering circuit. And uh, then the second part, as you remember, it's a uh, communication uh, time data processing. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, and uh, no in our uh, in this work we demonstrate communication data process on example of data sorting we could take another uh, task but we choose uh, we've chosen uh, data sorting it means that we would like to get all the uh, received data sorted immediately after the last item has been taken from the input because it's uh, it's communication time data processing. Here are the features of this uh, uh, processing. And um, again, sorted data can be transmitted almost immediately after receiving the last input item. See? As we receive the last item, we are ready uh, to present the result. Okay, uh, again, uh, some very simple introduction to our this second part of our system. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know this, uh, it's very old uh, notion of comparator, this one or this one. And uh, you see the two inputs, then maximum, no, greater value is is going to higher position, less is down. And in our case, we use such so-called uh, net, uh, networks of such comparators or sorting network. You know, and now it, it's interesting that now it's quite popular. Uh, again, the first works of about sorting network were done by Knut in this art of programming, you know, this famous book. It's done, no, I don't remember, but more than 30 years ago in any case. And uh, now, because FPGA are very good for this uh, no, parallel work, uh, then they are again returned to consideration by uh, this uh, design community. And uh, uh, look, what uh, the, these are comparators. No, what, let's say the, the, this is uh, uh, input data. Then, after first uh, um, stage, uh, something is changed, some order is established. The second stage, again, 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 and if uh, uh, no swap is uh, uh, done, then we have this already sorted output uh, of data. But look at that uh, any level, this is in green, it's uh, the same. And uh, any level can be reused. And what we do in our works, usually, we use this feedback here. Feedback. Uh, and uh, enable, again, enable here is uh, equal to one if there is at least one data swap in the second vertical line of comparators. Else enables zero, it means that all is done. Okay. Uh, uh, and now, uh, the, the, this is circuit that we, uh, that we use in our work. It's uh, totally uh, no, uh, uh, about the same as it previously. The idea was presented. We see the, here this feedback and uh, as soon as a new item is received it will immediately be placed in proper position here this registers for uh, writing of uh, this data that are going from uh, filtering subsystem yes and uh, as soon as a new item is received it will immediately be placed in proper position of the produce sorted subset that is composed of all previously required items. So now, okay. now is, uh, I return uh, back, this is our data filtering, remember, subsystem, re uh, real-time 
accumulated sorted that I told just now. And uh, any pre-filtered data item uh, received on the input can be immediately accommodated and subset and so on. It means that it's going in communication time very fastly. Okay. Implementation in hardware, as I told, we use FPGA. With FPGA, it's very convenient to work now because there are there are different uh, different uh, this prototype and boards. We, in this work, in, uh, in our uh, this uh, paper, we, for this paper we use uh, this Nexus 4. It's very cheap prototyping board. <laughs> I attract your attention to the price of this prototyping board. They are very cheap. And, uh, and often they are very powerful. Okay, and uh, experience uh, have shown that each coming data item is handled with the same time. That is required to read data from the dual port uh, RAM. Uh, this, uh, what this is, uh, uh, I'd like to attract uh, your attention that uh, the size of data n not, uh, M is 16 bits. You, know, you remember this uh, filtering, <coughs> where is input uh, as address? Uh, uh, 16 bits. No, it's uh, not so uh, small amount of uh, uh, bits, yes. But we need only one uh, uh, built in FPGA RAM in uh, APJ, but th there are hundreds of these RAMs in, in such normal APJs. Now, case okay, it's very simple. But, but uh, for this simple uh, board, uh, Nexus for uh, 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 more than uh, 1,000 data items can be handled even in this relatively simple APJ. Okay, can I, and uh, conclusions. Yes, uh, it, uh, no, it was uh, the, the, uh, the work was rewarded to, uh, to, uh, to fast processing of non repeated values, some of which can be discarded. <coughs> I'm sorry, on request. <laughs> the emphasis is done on real time applications in which data items have to be received and processed within minimal possible time. Uh, uh, the proposed solution model can evaluate in, in software and then uh, we, uh, uh, was implemented in hardware. No, and it, as usual, experiments have demonstrated that uh, all is working uh, uh, and all is good for the decision of our task. I think it's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Short questions. <laughs> so, uh, you had on slide number 12 uh, written that it's 16 bits. Yes. But before there was, you said the word is one bit. What ah, did you yeah, mean yeah, by that? 16 bits. Uh, I will turn back. 16 bits is, we can, we can yeah. see it as an address of this memory. Mm -hmm. Memor but memory was a memory of one bit. So, one bit. But one bit is zero or one. Yeah, zero one. So but uh, uh, there are two power sixteen places. Yes, but if you have the word of one bit, so you have either zero or one. So yeah, yeah, zero one. Yes. So if, if uh, data that are on this address yes. lines was, uh, was received previously. Then in this memory, there is already one. Oh, you just yeah 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, okay. this is, this is why it's uh, such a known other space. Okay. It's, a, it's a quite simple idea, but you know, we, we have many references, quite many references on our work. It's, it's working. And it, it, there was you not know, such simple FPGA. It's enough because FPGA has very good resources. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and now, who is the next? Oh, it's here. It's, it's
it's working. For the presentation, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jose Miguel. I'm working in the in Canada University in the south of Spain. I now yeah, I am a PhD, PhD in student. <laughs> uh, we present my my work with the title "I'm as an industrial meta model for automation system." This is the overview: software development in industrial automation system uh, (MDE) in industrial environment. The OPC UE standard "I'm as." And uh, modeling a climate room with IMAS at the end, the conclusion of the Futura work. Uh, the structural necessity in the industrial system are increased year per year, at point that the uh, software system is a very important part of the software of the industrial uh, environment, like an uh, electronic system um, pneumat or pneumatic system. Um, also, uh, the apparition of the new paradigms like um, uh, Industrial 4.0 uh, has accentuated this software necessity because we need to in, uh, integrate it, the IT system and the industrial uh, software system. And the traditional uh, technique for developed software could really not solve this necessity. So we need to uh, find new paradigm to uh, solve this necessity, like MD, model, model driven engineer. The main concept uh, or the main idea behind MDE is the abstraction. The abstraction uh, could be of the, of the way to resolve a complex system. A who uh, can achieve the abstraction using models and meta models. But uh, what is a meta model and model? A meta model uh, defines a language, a common language, for uh, construe or for build the abstraction. And this uh, construction of the result of this construction is a model. And we can say that a model is conformed and this meta model. Okay? But for deployment this uh, paradigm into the indust uh, industrial environment, we need uh, some standard or some platform that supported this, uh, this paradigm. And one of them could be OPC UA standard. The OPC UA standard is the last specification of the OPC uh, foundation and has two main pillars, the communication model and the information model. The communication model is out of scope of this uh, work, but the information model is very important for us uh, that we can uh, see after. Okay, IMAS is an industrial meta model that we see before. It is a specific meta model conceived for develop and up deployment on the industrial automation system. IMAS uh, uh, Provides a common system, a common concept that we can deploy this concept, uh, this concept in several parts of the industrial system that we can see uh, after. And the most important, from my point of view, is that provides systematic methodology for organize the signal or, or the devices in the industrial system. Okay. <coughs> and another important point is, is math is based or is extended the information model of the OPC UA. Okay. Do we have the abstraction level of the IMAS? We can deploy IMAS in the OPC UA, of course, and the industrial device also. This is the architecture uh, of IMAS. In this work, uh, we are focusing in the layer 0 and layer 1. Uh, is the layer 1, uh, the, co the, the abstraction level of this uh, layer is different between the of them. This is the most complex layer, uh, just now we are, I, we are finished this layer, but in, when I uh, working in this uh, paper only have deployment these two layers, okay? This is the uh, uh, information model of OPC UA, and this is the concept that we are using in IMAS, okay? The, mon the most important concept is object type. Um, we, uh, we can see here the extension of the IMAS uh, coming from the object type. We have two concepts or two objects, PLC, PLC data and simple object. This is the element of the layer zero. Also, we can see here the element of the layer one. In this level, we are focusing in the input and output of the devices 
uh, the analogic and digital uh, input and output. And this element uh, allows us um, abstraction of this type of uh, input and output. Okay. Uh, right now, we are focusing on deployment uh, IMAS into the OPC web server, and for that, and for this, we need to uh, first we need to translate the uh, meta model of IMAS in the XML file. After that, we need to compile this file, and in our case, we are developing uh, a specific uh, OPC web server in .NET because uh, for all the product that we have in the market are not uh, uh, very for the, the point of view of meta model is not complete, the product, the market product or the commercial product. So at the end, we, we decide to de develop an our prop, our uh, OPC UA server. Okay, this is the correlation between the concept of IMAS of the layer one, uh, layer zero, uh, and the translation in the XML file for OPC UA perspective. Um, with this is, is, more, is more or less directly. Uh, right now, we are focusing on the deployment the IMAS into the industrial uh, devices. In this case, we are using the uh, Siemens PLC. It's, it's not directly translation because this element we need to deploy for uh, a structure regarding of type of uh, data that we are using. Uh, in this case, we are using UDT, is a data type uh, defined by the user. And uh, this is the first step. And the second step we, is uh, organize the DB uh, data, data block into the PLC with this uh, UDT that we are defining before. Okay. Uh, at the end, we, are, we need to uh, provide our meta model in a real case. In this case, we are using a, a climatic rule uh, controlled by the same PLC. And these systems are divided in two subsystems. The first subsystem is here. It's the perturbation subsystem to introduce perturbation in the, in the system. And the second subsystem is the temperature regulator. It's with this system, we, we can regulate the temperature into the box. This is the, the model and the other is the model for the system. This is the result uh, because we have a, we have a I must deployment in the, in the, in the OPC UA. We have the meta model in the OPC UA server, and, and we can create model using this meta model. And this is the result of uh, the point of view for the OPC UA client. We can see here all the objects that we have defined in the uh, model, and this is the result of deployment in CMN PLC uh, using UDT. Okay. Um, this is uh, how finally the conclusion of the future world. It must provide a novel approach to simplify the description of the industrial process. Uh, and the application of MD uh, in several parts of the industrial system uh, achieves us achieve uh, to, to use the same concept because at the end, in the OPC way, we have the same model that we have in the same in the PLC, in the PLC on the industrial device. And how Fodure works, we want, we want to define automatical, automatically translation between the model and the uh, plaf deployment plaf platform, uh, for example, when we are thinking to uh, create automatic rules for take the model and create the game file. Um, another important uh, point for us is implementing the behavior of DMAS uh, using uh, some standard like I ISA H8. 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 Okay. Wasn't so easy to follow all the slides. <laughs> okay. And uh, maybe a few words. I, I, I've seen there was uh, one example of uh, implementation, but have you another one? Examples? Another example. Uh, well, uh, the, this year we are presenting on the con uh, and the. Um, a special uh, Siemens uh, work in Spain so with another, another uh, university and I use IMAS for develop a, 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 a special packaging system 
and it's working fine. I'm working in our laboratories in automation, and in this year in HBIC system, I start deploying IMAS and working. <laughs> so I think it's very, it's a, it's a way to organize the signal in the, in the, in the industrial it, system. It, it means that you are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay, maybe somebody would like to ask. Thank you again. Now, uh, we were too fast because we, we missed the, <laughs> the presentation of Andrews from Lithuania. Hello everybody, uh, I am Andrus Lutschka from Columbus University of Technology and uh, my uh, PhD uh, work will be uh, to create a mathematical model uh, which could uh, control um, uh, granulation process of fertilizers. And one of the uh, topic is uh, that I need uh, um, uh, create a system which could control, uh, which could measure uh, the particles of fertilizers in real time and uh, enough uh, with uh, good uh, accuracy. <coughs> uh, in short, I will talk about uh, fertilizers, uh, particle size distribution, uh, main uh, uh, parameters, and uh, image processing and mathematical model. Uh, firstly, I should uh, start talking uh, and say uh, I started talk and uh, said that uh, the increasing number of people uh, means uh, high demand for food, and uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, treats in agricultural production uh, such as pests. Uh, loss of soil fertility or uh, lack of uh, nutrients uh, may result in low percentage uh, uh, for plants uh, to harvest. Uh, all uh, nutrients in our food are come from the soil and uh, the farmers need to work with healthy soil uh, that we could get uh, uh, the food with uh, full of nutrients. Uh, these nutrients are uh, potassium, calcium, nitrogen, and other. And fertilizers uh, will affect the general health of the uh, plant. <coughs> uh, the benefits of granulated fertilizers, uh, the effect of uh, granulated fertilizers lasts longer than uh, liquid fertilizers because the solid is absorbed in a uh, slower rate. Uh, an advantage of slow release granulation, uh, uh, granulated uh, fertilizers is that uh, you don't have to apply it very often. Also, it occupies small, smaller volume. Uh, it is a, a better um, solution for storing. Uh, has a better aerodynamics for spreaders uh, uh, and some other uh, uh, <coughs> more accurate fertilization, uh, safe use of feed granules. Uh, granulation is the process of combining uh, particles together uh, by creating uh, Bonds, bonds between them. Uh, bonds are uh, created by compression or by using a binding agent when we are talking about uh, wet granulation. And uh, one of the most important uh, parameters of uh, granules is uh, granular size, average of it. It's, uh, uh, the name of this parameter is D50. 
and uh, for that parameter, the most, uh, the biggest impact have uh, moisture. Uh, that means that uh, when we have uh, too much moisture, moisture in uh, granulation process, we we will get uh, big uh, oversized uh, granules, and in our way, we get undersized. That means that uh, uh, we will get. Uh, Decreased uh, manufacturing capacities and increased uh, energy consumptions because we need uh, these granules to uh, rework. Uh, yeah, particle size distribution is very important in factories uh, because it's a given information about the quality of uh, these particles. And there is a few parameters. Uh, one of them is uh, D50, the average of particles, and another is uh, GSI and UI, uh, uh, granul uh, granulometric spread index, which give information about the spread uh, of the granulation, the accuracy of uh, uh, possibility to uh, uniform to. Uh, uh, feed granules uniform and uh, uniformity index uh, gives us information about the var variance uh, in particle size distribution. Uh, at the moment, uh, factories using uh, uh, sieves methodology, methodology uh, this means that uh, the measurements are performed uh, only every few hours and you can't uh, see uh, the differences in real time. <coughs> uh, how it's uh, measuring uh, uh, the particle size distribution? Uh, factories uh, in the laboratory using uh, uh, sieves. Uh, we have a few sieves with different uh, hole size. And after some uh, variations, uh, we just weight uh, uh, the particles on different particles and get uh, the distribution. Uh, if we want to uh, control the granulation process, we need to get information on real time. Uh, there is a few indirect uh, measuring methods uh, which uh, gives us uh, quite accurate information. Uh, one of them uh, with which I am working is uh, image processing. I'm using a camera and uh, I could uh, get uh, particle size distribution. Um, here you can see that volumetric distribution is equal to the mass distribution which you get uh, the <coughs> laboratory in the factory. And uh, the image processing. I'm, all, I using, I'm using only one camera. Uh, that means that I get a two-dimensional uh, picture. Uh, so I need to approximate uh, my uh, granules. And the, the most accurate uh, results will be get uh, if I approximate it by Alice. And uh, after that, I can calculate uh, the volume uh, of my particles. Uh, also, uh, this measurement is not ideal. Uh, I get, um, it depends on the granular size. <coughs> if I uh, have a uh, uh, granules, which are almost uh, ideal uh, spheres, uh, circles, uh, I could use only sieve factor, one uh, coefficient, uh, which uh, gives my, uh, opportunity to me uh, to change uh, the cumulative curve. Uh, here you see the red one, uh, here you see a histogram of uh, granulous distribution and the red one is cumulative curve and the black one is uh, measured with camera and if you have uh, uh, the bigger 
uh, gangless, the, the best, better. Uh, you could use C factor, which uh, gives uh, the opportunity uh, to take the scalmolator curve to the left or to the right, and that's enough. But if we are talking about uh, the granules, which size is smaller one, one mi than one millimeter, uh, we need to use uh, some mathematical, mathematical model, uh, which could help uh, to recalculate our results. And one of the, more of the simplest model could be a least squares polynomial. And uh, the main idea uh, is to control uh, the granulation process. Uh, we need uh, to take uh, samples at a um, short time and measure particle size distribution. Also need to get uh, moisture and temperature and some maybe other uh, parameters, uh, which uh, could be implemented in our mathematical model. And we can offer an operator to choose the uh, most uh, accurate uh, uh, parameters for controlling the granulation process. And in conclusion, is that uh, the sifting method is widely used in uh, uh, factories and uh, indirect measurements uh, enable us to implement. Uh, to automate the measure measurement process and uh, real-time real measurements give us possibility to control the uh, granulation process. At the moment, uh, about 10 of the systems working in the local factories and uh, I'm testing it on the real uh, production line. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting presentation because it's for me it's a something new area. <laughs> I listen much of knowledge. Okay, we have time for questions. What is the, the average mean error basically from uh, estimation to the values on the work? Uh, it's about uh, from three to five percent. But if you're using the, say, like we say that a circle or arrow, uh, you could get results which are very far from the real uh, particle size distribution. What three five is good enough, right? But you, if you recalculate it with uh, mathematical models, uh, you could get almost ideal. Okay. Somebody else? <coughs> go, uh, <laughs> I was because it's interesting for me. Uh, it, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, this should be working in real time. Yeah. Uh, it means, uh, does it mean that uh, you need to optimize your models or to something to accelerate and so on. Which task were decided to reach this real time? The real time is that uh, we get the correct uh, sample mm -hmm. uh, and uh, get the PSD. Mm -hmm. And also measure the moisture, temperature, and uh, this data could be analyzed in real time. <laughs> you see, it, it means that no, uh, there were no uh, uh, problems uh, to calculate la la fa more faster and so on. Uh, this is, we are talking to about... Uh, 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 yeah, but, but we are talking about uh, from 3 to 6 to uh, 8 uh, minutes. You have to have uh, en en enough time. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, now, the, the last, not the least, uh, presentation. It's a presentation from Turkey. Abdullah uh, will tell us about the deep neural network classifier. 
for this recording human brain activity based on magneto and magnetoencephalography. Thank you for being here today. I am Abdullah Çalışkan from Erciyes University from Turkey. Uh, I am here today to talk to about a deep neural network classifier for decoding human brain activity based on magnetoencephalography. I have divided my presentation into four uh, sections. First section, magnetoencephalography. Second, method. Third, experimental result. The last one is conclusion. So, as I mentioned, the first thing is about MEG signals and magnetoencephalography. MEG signals is produced by the brain. Uh, as you know, the brain is a very powerful and very complex organ which makes us human being. It is responsible for our thoughts, for our feelings, for our memory, for our perception, and everything else is happen. And uh, therefore, it is great uh, to know how it works. So there exists lots of uh, many uh, several brain imaging techniques to understand how it works. First. Uh, one of the most important brain imaging techniques is MEG, MEG magneto and solography. Magneto means magnetism and sologro means brain, graft means images. Magneto and solography means a magnetism of the image of brain. And let us uh, to pass the other section brain decoding uh, brain decoding uh, by analyzing human brain uh, scientists may able to decode human brain thoughts uh, their uh, dreams even uh, their perceptions uh, therefore in our study we try to decode the human brain by using a simple visual stimulus you see a subject, uh, when subject, uh, a subject is presented a visual stimuli uh, inside the brain, there will be a pattern, pattern of the recorded signal. And according to this pattern, we try to predict uh, subject C face or scrabble face. Uh, however, this process is uh, very complex and uh, by to analyze the max signals is uh, very hard due to uh, max signals uh, has uh, lots of uh, time series besides it's corrupted with significant amount of no noises therefore uh, to in order to analyze the max signal you need uh, three main process first is uh, feature First, you need uh, pre-processing steps and uh, feature extraction process. And the last one is uh, the uh, classifi classification. Uh, so, uh, max signals need significant classifier to decode the human brain activity. Uh, in our work, we focus on uh, to design a good classifier. And it is a very popular classifier deep neural network classifier. Uh, deep neural network classifier, the pattern of the brain signals is sent to, to classifier and uh, classifier uh, predict uh, people subject C, scrabble face or non-scrabble face. And uh, the proposed DNN consists of two parts. The first part is autoencoder and softmax classifier. And uh, DNN classifier offers the ability of autoencoder uh, to produce the feature from raw feature and the capability of the softmax classifier to uh, classify the labels correctly. And the main part of the DNN network is autoencoder. Autoencoder is a simple neural network actually. Uh, 
it is uh, it consists of two layer first layer input layer second layer is hidden layer the last layer is output layer the uh, actually uh, auto encoder has two parts first part is encoder parts uh, the second part is decoder parts uh, encoder parts connect to input to hidden layer uh, decoder parts connect hidden layer to in output layer uh, and uh, objective function auto encoder uh, actually is similar to a uh, normal neural network uh, fit forward neural network we are try to uh, between the uh, system output and uh, label to uh, decrease the error and these the weights uh, which are try to tune uh, I will not explain detailly this part due to limited time uh, softmax classifier uh, softmax classifier is a supervisor layer of deep classifier which generalizes the logistic regression it is a simple classifier and uh, very suitable to deep neural network training of DNN classifier has three parts um, first of all you have to uh, train the autoencoder uh, and the train autoencoder of the uh, hidden layer send it to softmax layer to make prediction and then uh, encoder part autoencoder is taken and softmax layer is taken uh, are combined to produce the DNN network and uh, after this uh, these weights uh, can be tuned one more time by convenient optimization algorithm in our case we use LBFGC algorithm limited memory algorithm um, the other section is experimental results uh, the human brain decoding with max signals is achieved by using the train DNN classifier we try to uh, a subject a C face or scrabble face the data set is originally by created 6 and modified it back the Mac 2014 competition. Uh, data set is contained 16 subject with uh, 563. Uh, as I mentioned before, Mac signal have 206 channel. Uh, training of DNN, the parameter of the DNN is chosen uh, just uh, like and we have nearly 10,000 example and 2,000 features is a very large data sets and it has very uh, has several features uh, we use uh, five cross validation techniques with 30 independent runs to analyze to verify our uh, methods uh, we compare uh, the, we compare the DNN classifier with traditional methods including SVM, NIPS, uh, and decision tree. Results uh, are analyzed over obtained rates. Uh, the obtained results are uh, supported with statistical analysis including the man mitne test and uh, rock raft. And uh, this, as can be shown in this figure, uh, for uh, 30 uh, runs uh, accuracy of the DNN is each time has better performance than the, the other methods used in this paper uh, and you see the mean value of the 30 runs uh, DNN is the, has the better average uh, rates uh, uh, DNN has also uh, has the lowest standard deviation uh, this means that uh, DNN is more stable than the, the other methods and uh, also uh, DNN has the best arc value what means arc value uh, you see uh, DNN with blue curve uh, area under the uh, blue curve is largest for uh, DNN 
it has the largest value uh, arc value is approached to one this means the your classifier is approached to perfectness uh, so uh, the last one the statistical results we use the uh, to verify our experimental results we use DNN classifier uh, oh, sorry we, we use the man Whitney U test U test to class uh, to compare uh, the DNN with the uh, conventional methods and the results show us uh, DNN has the better performance uh, and has better significance uh, with uh, p-value is lower than 0 0.05 uh, and conclusion uh, in our work we have present a very efficient classifier for decoding human brain activity uh, from max signals uh, our simulation results uh, demonstrate that uh, DNN classifier is better than the, the other methods used in this paper. Uh, as a future work, other possible application of purpose classifier uh, should be explored in both clinical and non-clinical domain. And our purpose classifier can be used uh, to analyze different cortical region of the brain. Uh, thanks for listening. Actually, we uh, uh, we selected for uh, the DNN is uh, has DNN is a very popular method is now. Uh, the other method is actually is applied to uh, analyze such a things. However, the DNN network is not used before. Uh, we tried to uh, make uh, something different and we obtained good results. No, especially for how you select your data and separate it into well, training, validation and testing. Because the results you show only shows one, so basically we are asking we, which part uh, of... Uh, we, uh, we use five cross-validation techniques. We, uh, we uh, divided our uh, data set five parts and uh, four parts uh, used for uh, training and the remaining part for testing and this process is repeated uh, for five uh, parts. Yes, of course. Uh, therefore, uh, we can uh, conclude it. Can we ask about the data? Because uh, I understand this is not your data, you are obtained it from some yes, database, yes, right? Yes, yeah. uh, Do you have some information about signal-to-noise ratio of your obvious uh, magnetic... Uh, what's the... No, what's no, the actually, I don't know. A very silly question. It's always this uh, ne neural networks, they are so complex to implement, uh, they are so time consuming and so on. Uh, maybe you could do it without neural networks. And, uh, another if we use uh, normal neural network, it cannot handle this uh, huge data sets. Uh, actually, uh, you have to wait uh, too many times. Okay, maybe somebody will let us. Because, uh, Abdullah, your presentation is concluding our session and not only our session but the conference because well, at least in this room eight. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.